Approaches to artificial intelligence generally fall into two categories, symbolic and non-symbolic. Sometimes symbolic AI is referred to as rule-based AI, and non-symbolic AI as sub-symbolic or connectionist AI. You might well know it as neural networks. Me? I call it neural networks. Together, these represent the two main wings of artificial intelligence, and like the wings of any organisation, they have not always been on friendly terms with each other. What is symbolic AI? Well, it's pretty much what it says. Applications in which pieces of information are stored as symbols or discrete entities inside the code. Individual variables, if you prefer. Suppose you had a programme whose purpose was to decide whether an applicant for a mortgage should be given one. It would require several pieces of information on the person, such as his or her annual income, credit rating score, age, gender, profession and so on. And on the basis of all those characteristics, it gives a decision, approving the mortgage or declining it. Each of those pieces of information is stored as a simple variable, with meaningful names such as credit rating and profession, and then processed using rules that can be understood by reading through the code. They might not mean much to people not trained in the field, but a mortgage professional could probably make sense of them. Alternatively, let's take a look at the code of the programme I presented to you last week, my version of Donald Mickey's Menace. I won't go into the details of it, but take a look at the variables you can see there. Any idea what any of those do? Even knowing nothing about the programme, you can probably tell that it is a game of some sort between a human player and a computer. The identity of the winner is probably stored in the variable winner, and there are a series of moves recorded in an array called record moves. It's not obvious what the array TTT is for, or the variable MV, but reading through more of the code will probably explain what these were. The code also contains functions such as pick move, count beads, and check for win. So an intelligent person looking at the code would get some sort of idea of how the program works and how it processes information. Of course, it's possible to change the code so that every variable name and every function name was a jumble of random letters, but it wouldn't change the fact that information is stored in discrete pieces of data. For the first three decades of AI research, what some nostalgic researchers refer to as the golden age, the approach was almost entirely symbolic. Then, as now, Computer programs took the form of individual statements that dealt with discrete variables and carried out instructions one at a time in a predictable manner. A good example of this is the language Common Business Oriented Language, or COBOL, popular at the time for writing programs used in commercial and financial applications. The symbolic nature of this language is obvious when you read a section of COBOL code. Indeed, although COBOL has generally fallen out of fashion in modern IT, there is a market for applications that can read legacy COBOL programs and extract the business logic from it. This is only possible because COBOL is a highly symbolic language. What about non-symbolic AI? Well, as the name implies, this is artificial intelligence in which pieces of information aren't stored as discrete items. Instead, the intelligence is distributed throughout the entire system in some amorphous fashion. They are inspired, to a greater or lesser extent, by biological brains the human brain in particular. Brains consist of vast numbers of fairly simple cells, called neurons, connected together. Signals pass throughout the network of these cells, and somehow intelligent behaviour results. These neural networks, networks of simulated neurons, do represent concepts, as the symbolic programmes do, but these concepts are spread over several or many neurons. For example, the concept of the grandmother cell was debated in the 1960s, what, people asked, would happen if the human brain contained single cells used for recognising individual concepts, for example, the person's grandmother? Suppose there was only one cell in your brain which activated when you saw your grandmother. It would have to be connected to vast numbers of cells in your visual cortex, the part of the brain that processes signals from the eyes. But when your grandmother appeared in your field of view, this cell would activate. The question is, what would happen if this particular cell died or was damaged? Would you stop recognising your grandmother, in spite of the fact that she was standing right in front of you? Well, there are many deaths of neurons in the brain all the time, and even neurons that don't die can't remain active indefinitely. Neurons, like muscles, get tired and have to shut off periodically before they can activate again. Even so, we generally don't lose the ability to recognise family members or to understand other concepts. This indicates that those same concepts 
can't generally be localised to one or two neurons in the brain, but instead are spread out over many. Cells can die or fatigue and recover, and there are always other connected cells that can take up the slack. Even as early as the 1940s, there were tentative steps being taken to model very simple parts of the brain in computer programmes and mechanical devices. In 1949, the pioneer of neurology, Donald Hebb, proposed that information could be stored in the connections between neurons in the brain, and that they would form overlapping subnetworks that would activate and interact with each other. Six years before that, Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts discussed the modelling of individual neurons as mathematical processes. Progress was slow, but by the 1960s, simple neural networks were starting to appear, using models of neurons called linear perceptrons. A perceptron was a simple model of a neuron that took in several inputs and produced a single output, which was a number that was either 0, representing inactive, or 1, representing active. Various parameters were set so that the perceptron's output could be adjusted depending on the values of the inputs. Typically, a perceptron worked like this. Each of the inputs is multiplied by a particular strength value, called its weight, making some inputs more influential than others. The sum of these weighted inputs is compared to a threshold. If it meets or exceeds the threshold, the perceptron produces the output value 1. Otherwise, it produces 0. This mimics in some way the action of real neurons, which receive electrochemical signals through a series of connections called synapses. Some of these connections are stronger than others, the weights of the perceptron, and if the neuron receives enough activation, it activates or fires. One simple perceptron was fairly useless by itself, but the proponents argued that they could be made more powerful by combining them. The inputs were fed not just to one perceptron, but to a number of them, and the outputs from those perceptrons then became the input for more perceptrons. We talk about a layer of perceptrons processing inputs and feeding activity into another layer. This can continue for a number of layers, with the last one providing the actual outputs. The whole thing is referred to as a multi-layer perceptron. Things were starting to look promising for perceptrons and non-symbolic AI in general. Then they hit a roadblock, the exclusive ore problem. Bear with me. Consider a perceptron with two inputs, each weighted by a different value. If we call one of those inputs X and the other Y, then the output of the perceptron can be marked on a simple XY graph. We'll mark every combination of inputs that causes the perceptron to produce a 1 with a red dot, and every combination that produces a zero with a green dot. We'll find that the graph is divided by a straight line, with every spot on one side red and every spot on the other green. The exact slope and position of the line depends on the value of the weights and the threshold. For example, if the weight on input x was minus 1, and the weight on input y was plus 1, then the total weighted input will be y minus x. If the threshold was set at zero, then the perceptron will produce 1 only if y was bigger than x, or the same as x. It would act as a simple way of comparing the two inputs. Using a multilayer perceptron, the line between the red region and the green region can become more complicated. Of course, with more than two inputs, we can't just plot the red and green points on a flat xy graph. But such a graph can be used to demonstrate an arbitrarily complicated division line between the two regions. I certainly couldn't show you a five-dimensional graph on a YouTube presentation. However, there is one type of graph that such a multilayer perceptron can't cope with, and that's the sort of graph at the bottom of the screen. For a point to be marked red, either both x and y must be positive, or they must both be negative. If x is positive and y negative, or vice versa, then the multilayer perceptron must produce zero. This is called an exclusive or situation. The problem is that multilayer perceptrons, as I have described them, can't do this. They can only be used to classify inputs if you can draw a line on a flat graph or a complex surface in a multidimensional one with all the red points on one side and all the green points on the other. It can be a complicated line with multiple parts in it, like the one at the top of the screen, but it divides all the red points from all the green ones. In the exclusive OR graph at the bottom, it is impossible to draw a single line that separates the red points from the green ones. Try it. It is called an inseparable problem. Multilayer perceptrons, in the way that they have been described, can't classify inseparable problems. 
The hammer blow came when Marvin Minsky and Seymour Papert published their seminal book, Perceptrons, an Introduction to Computational Geometry, in 1969, in which they laid out the severe limitations of perceptrons in all their combinations. Not only did they demonstrate mathematically that simple multilayer perceptrons could not classify the exclusive ore, but they also proved that however many layers of perceptrons you stack on top of each other, they can all be represented by a single layer of perceptrons if the weights are set properly, i.e. the maths can be used to collapse all the layers down to one, which will do exactly the same job. Reactions to the book were mixed. Many of the symbolic AI researchers cheered, seeing the perceptron researchers as their rivals. Indeed, the mathematics outlined in the book was irrefutable. However, people who had pinned their hopes on this field of AI loathed Minsky and Papert for what they had done and burned them in effigy. Perhaps their hatred was at least partly justified, as, thanks to Minsky and Papert's book, funding for perceptron research was stopped. Neural networks as a field was dead. What wasn't known in the AI community at the time was that with one small change, multilayer perceptrons could easily have tackled the exclusive ore problem and handled twisting boundary lines enclosing as many disconnected regions as you like. Their drawback was that the total weighted input was simply compared with the threshold, giving an all or nothing result. If this were to be replaced by a different function, called a sigmoid, then they would stop being linear perceptrons and will once again become useful. However, it wasn't until, until the early 1980s and the formulation of a procedure for training these new style of multilayer perceptrons, called the back propagation algorithm, that neural networks were taken seriously as a tool in artificial intelligence research. With back propagation and the sigmoid transfer functions, multilayer perceptrons quickly became established as a powerful and flexible means of pattern matching. I will naturally be devoting later videos to this topic. The irony is that since then, neural networks and non-symbolic AI has largely eclipsed symbolic AI at the cutting edge of the subject. It's not as though symbolic AI is useless or hasn't provided humanity with useful results, more that it's not producing the exciting developments anymore. It's like a seam of coal that has just about been mined to completion. AI research has its trends, just like any other field of human endeavour, and at the moment, the latest sexy thing is an approach to neural networks called deep learning. However, fashions come and go, and what is considered stale today sometimes makes a comeback tomorrow. I don't think we've heard the last of symbolic AI just yet. And, to be fair, symbolic AI does have advantages that neural networks don't. It is somewhere between hard and impossible to work out exactly how the knowledge is stored in a neural network, or how it reasons, since that knowledge is stored in a large number of weight values, which is nothing more than a long list of numbers. A program using symbolic AI can usually be interrogated much more easily. Indeed, various expert systems, which ask human users questions and draw conclusions, have been implemented with a why are you asking me this feature, allowing the user to delve into the reasoning involved. And that's where I shall end this lecture. Accompanying this video is Code Part 2. I thought it would amuse you to see a JavaScript rendition of a type of neural net called an Interactive Activation and Competition Network. This isn't exactly a standard architecture, and I don't recall any recent examples, but I have chosen to implement one from a few decades ago called the Jets and the Sharks. Now we come to the answer to the question that I posed to you at the end of last week's video. You thought I'd forgotten, didn't you? Well, you're right, I had, which is why I'm tacking this part on the end of this week's video. You'll recall that I presented you with two poems, one written by a human and one by a computer, and challenged you to work out which was which. Now I can tell you that poem A on the left was written by the poet Frank O'Hara, while poem B on the right was written by a computer program. Did you get it right? That's truly the end of today's video. Please do leave a comment below, and, if you liked what you saw, don't forget to subscribe and click the like button.